The Story of Peter Rabbit Long ago, there were four little rabbits with names Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. They lived underground with their mother beneath a massive fir tree in a sandbank. One morning, their mother, Mrs. Rabbit, had some advice for her little ones. She told them that they could play in the fields or explore down the lane, but they must never enter Mr. McGregor's garden because something terrible had happened to their father there. He ended up in a pie made by Mrs. McGregor. Mrs. Rabbit then went out to run some errands. She carried a basket and her umbrella and went through the woods to visit the baker. She bought a loaf of brown bread and five currant buns. While Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail, being good bunnies, went down the lane to pick blackberries. Peter, the naughty one, decided to head straight to Mr. McGregor's garden and squeezed under the gate. At first, he nibbled on lettuces and French beans, then munched on radishes. Feeling ill from eating too much, he went to look for some parsley. But just when he thought he was safe, he ran into Mr. McGregor, who was planting young cabbages on his hands and knees. Mr. McGregor noticed Peter and chased after him, waving a rake and shouting, Stop thief! Peter was scared out of his wits. He ran all over the garden, forgetting the way to the gate. He lost one of his shoes among the cabbages and the other among the potatoes. Panicked, he ran faster on all fours, almost getting away. However, he ended up in a gooseberry net, and the large buttons on his jacket got caught. His new blue jacket with brass buttons was left behind as he managed to wriggle free. Peter dashed into a tool shed and jumped into a bucket. Unfortunately, it was filled with water, so it wasn't a good hiding spot. Mr. McGregor was certain Peter was in the tool shed, perhaps under a flower pot. He started searching the shed, looking under every pot. Suddenly, Peter sneezed because of the cold water in the can. Mr. McGregor rushed over, attempting to catch. Luckily, Peter managed to wriggle out just in time, leaving his jacket behind. Peter went out of the tool shed. After a long running, he found a door in the wall, but it was locked and too small for Peter to fit through. An old mouse was rushing in and out, carrying peas and beans for her family. Peter asked for directions to the gate, but the mouse had a big pea in her mouth and couldn't answer. She just shook her head, making Peter cry. Peter was getting more and more confused about which way to go when he came to a pond where Mr. McGregor was filling his water cans. A white cat was watching some goldfish, but Peter wisely decided not to engage with her. He'd heard about cats from his cousin, little Benjamin Bunny. Peter headed back towards the tool shed, but then he heard the sound of a hole scratching the ground. Peter hid beneath some bushes. After nothing happened for a while, he climbed onto a wheelbarrow and peered over. He saw Mr. McGregor planting onions with his back to Peter. Peter quietly got down from the wheelbarrow and ran as fast as he could along a straight path behind some bushes. Mr. McGregor spotted him at the corner, but Peter didn't care. He slipped under the gate and was safe in the woods outside the garden. Mr. McGregor got angry, and he used Peter's little jacket and shoes as a scarecrow to frighten the blackbirds. Peter never stopped running or looked back until he reached his burrow under the big fir tree. He was so tired that he flopped down on the soft sand inside his rabbit hole and closed his eyes. His mother, who had been cooking for dinner, wondered what had happened to his clothes. It was the second jacket and pair of shoes that Peter had lost in a fortnight. Unfortunately, Peter wasn't feeling well that evening. His mother put him to bed and made him some chamomile tea, giving him a spoonful to take at bedtime. While Peter had his dose of chamomile tea, Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail had bread and milk with blackberries for supper. Polar Bears Polar bears have a distinctive appearance, with their white fur helping them blend in with the snow and ice. 
They have a layer of fat called blubber, which keeps them warm in freezing temperatures. Their large paws, equipped with sharp claws, are perfect for walking on ice and swimming in icy waters. Polar bears are found in the Arctic regions of Alaska, Canada, Greenland, Norway, and Russia. They prefer to live near the coasts and spend much of their time on sea ice, where they hunt for their favorite food seals. Seals are the primary source of food for polar bears. With their excellent swimming skills, polar bears can quietly approach seals resting on the ice and catch them by surprise. Their powerful jaws and sharp teeth help them devour their prey. Polar bears are excellent swimmers, capable of covering long distances in the freezing Arctic waters. They use their front paws to paddle and their back legs to steer, just like a seal. Their thick layer of blubber helps them stay warm while swimming. Female polar bears give birth to their cubs in winter dens made from snow and ice. These dens provide a safe and warm place for the cubs to grow. The mother takes great care of her cubs, nursing them and teaching them important skills until they are ready to explore the world. Unfortunately, polar bears are facing many challenges due to climate change. The melting of the Arctic sea ice affects their hunting abilities and disrupts their natural habitat. As a result, their population is decreasing and they are classified as a vulnerable species. Many organizations and scientists are working hard to protect polar bears and their fragile ecosystem. Efforts are being made to raise awareness about climate change and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. These actions are crucial for preserving the future of polar bears and the Arctic environment. Polar bears are extraordinary creatures that call the Arctic their home. From their unique adaptations to their remarkable hunting skills, they have captivated the imaginations of people of all ages. It is important for us to take action and protect these magnificent giants, ensuring a future where they can continue to roam the icy landscapes of the Arctic. Together, we can make a difference and ensure the survival of polar bears for generations to come. The Adventure to the Wonderful Wizard of Oz A long time ago, there was a girl called Dorothy. On a small farm in Kansas, Dorothy lived with her aunt and uncle and her dog, Toto. Her house was very far from the village, so she didn't have any friends. Dorothy's aunt and uncle were busy all the time, so she had to play only with her dog, Toto. Her only friend was Toto, and Dorothy always wished she could make more friends. One day, a big storm was approaching their house. It was a tornado. Dorothy's aunt and uncle rushed to a safe underground shelter to protect themselves. Only Dorothy and Toto were left in the house. Dorothy's house was swept away by a tornado. Before long, the strong wind lifted Dorothy's house. Outside the house, the tornado carried the house to a magical land called Oz. The house landed in the magical land of Oz. Unintentionally, the house squashed the Wicked Witch of the East, killing her beneath it. However, Dorothy had no clue what had occurred. She didn't even know where she was. A crowd of people gathered around Dorothy's house. They were the Munchkins, inhabitants of the eastern part of Oz. They were small and kind folks. They informed Dorothy that she had arrived in the land of Oz and that her house had eliminated the Wicked Witch of the East. They rejoiced at being liberated from the evil witch's control. They expressed their gratitude to Dorothy and celebrated her arrival. Despite everyone's gratitude, Dorothy only wished to return to her home in Kansas. Soon after, the Witch of the North appeared. She was a good witch, known as the Good Witch of the North. She also commended Dorothy for defeating the Wicked Witch. Even though the Good Witch didn't know the secret power of the shoes, she asked Dorothy to wear the deceased witch's magical shoes. After putting on the shoes, Dorothy requested the assistance of the Good Witch to return to her home in Kansas. The Good Witch advised Dorothy to meet the wonderful Wizard of Oz, who resided in the Emerald City, and follow the Yellow Road to reach there. Additionally, the Good Witch bestowed upon Dorothy a mark of her kiss as a gift. 
This kiss mark provided magical protection to keep Dorothy safe. Dorothy and Toto embarked on a journey to the Emerald City to meet the wonderful Wizard of Oz. During her journey, Dorothy came across a scarecrow who lacked a brain. The scarecrow wished for a brain so that he could think and learn new things. Feeling sorry for him, Dorothy decided to assist the scarecrow. She invited him to join her on the way to the Emerald City. They became friends and embarked together on their journey to meet the Wizard of Oz. Dorothy was happy to make her first friend with Scarecrow, apart from her dog, Toto. As they passed through a forest, they encountered Tin Man, a woodcutter, standing motionless. Tin Man, made of tin or steel and holding an axe, was rusty and unable to move. Dorothy noticed his immobility and fetched some oil from nearby. With the application of oil, Tin Man regained his freedom of movement. Tin Man revealed that he lacked a heart and could not experience emotions such as love. He longed to have a heart so that he could once again feel love and emotions. Tin Man expressed his desire to seek the Wizard of Oz's assistance in obtaining a heart. This time, Dorothy decided to help Tin Man, and he joined her journey. Now, Dorothy, Scarecrow, and Tin Man continued their march towards the Emerald City to meet the Wizard of Oz. On their journey to the Emerald City where the wonderful Wizard of Oz lived, Tin Man began to tell his sad love story. Once, Tin Man was an ordinary man who fell in love with a girl in his neighborhood. However, a wicked witch became envious of their love and cursed Tin Man, causing him to lose his arms, legs, and even his neck. Despite his misfortune, Tin Man sought help from a blacksmith, who managed to repair his body, allowing him to survive. Unfortunately, the witch also took away his heart, which proved beyond the blacksmith's ability to repair, leaving Tin Man's heart empty. Despite these hardships, Tin Man could not help but continue loving the girl. He remained determined to retrieve his heart. Upon hearing Tin Man's story, Dorothy sensed that he was genuinely warm-hearted and seemed to possess a kind heart already. As they continued their journey, they encountered a lion who was terribly afraid of everything, even a small rat. This lion, known as Cowardly Lion, wished to have courage so that he could be brave and confront his fears. Dorothy decided to lend a helping hand to Cowardly Lion as well. Now, there were Dorothy, Toto, Scarecrow, Tin Man, and Cowardly Lion together. All of them embarked on the journey towards the Emerald City together. In the magical land of Oz, Dorothy formed friendships with Scarecrow, Tin Man, and Cowardly Lion. They set off on a journey to seek the assistance of the Wizard of Oz. Each of them had a specific desire they hoped the wizard could fulfill. Scarecrow wanted a brain to become intelligent. Tin Man desired a heart to experience emotions. Cowardly Lion longed to gain courage and be brave. Dorothy's ultimate goal was to find a way back home to Kansas. During their travels, they came across a wide river that needed to be crossed. However, none of them knew how to swim, and there was no bridge in sight. Scarecrow came up with a brilliant plan. He noticed a heap of wood nearby and proposed building a raft. Dorothy, Tin Man, and Cowardly Lion all pitched in, collecting the wood and constructing the raft. Once the raft was finished, they climbed aboard and gently pushed it into the water. Together, they paddled across the river. Dorothy noticed that despite lacking a brain, Scarecrow displayed remarkable wisdom. Whenever the group faced confusion and lost their way, Scarecrow guided them on the correct path. In the face of unexpected challenges, Scarecrow promptly devised clever strategies. Dorothy believed that Scarecrow was already one of the smartest beings in the world and didn't actually require a brain at all. The raft found itself in the middle of a river with a strong current. It was out of control and drifting endlessly. 
It was a critical situation, and someone had to take action before they all drowned. However, everyone was too scared to move. Suddenly, Cowardly Lion took a deep breath and leaped into the water. He began pulling the raft towards the opposite riverbank. At first, Cowardly Lion was terrified to enter the water, pull the raft, and cross the river. But he understood that he needed to be brave for the sake of his friends. With all his strength, Cowardly Lion swam and tugged the raft to the other side. Cowardly Lion received praise from his friends for his bravery in facing his fear. They all safely reached the other side of the river and continued their journey to meet the Wizard of Oz. From that moment onward, they worked together to overcome any obstacles they encountered during their adventure. One day, Dorothy and her friends, Scarecrow, Tin Man, and Cowardly Lion, found themselves in a peculiar field filled with flowers. While walking through the field, Dorothy, Cowardly Lion, and Toto suddenly grew incredibly tired and fell into a deep sleep right where they stood. Scarecrow and Tin Man attempted to wake them up, but their efforts proved fruitless. They noticed that all the other animals and creatures in the field were also in a deep slumber. Scarecrow and Tin Man were unable to rouse their friends and felt uncertain about what to do. They realized that it was crucial for all of them to escape from this dangerous field promptly. Otherwise, their friends would remain trapped in eternal sleep and eventually perish. However, they were at a loss as to how to proceed. It was then that Tin Man spotted a small mouse being chased by a large cat. The terrified mouse seemed desperate for help. Out of sympathy for the fleeing mouse, Tin Man swung his axe in front of the cat, scaring it away. The grateful mouse thanked Tin Man for saving her life and revealed herself to be the queen mouse of the field. In gratitude for Scarecrow's compassionate act, she commanded her mice to carry Dorothy, Toto, and Cowardly Lion out of the treacherous field. As a result, Tin Man's kind-hearted action ultimately saved the lives of his friends in the perilous field. Dorothy and her friends finally arrived at the outskirts of the Emerald City, the Grand Palace where the wonderful Wizard of Oz lived. Seeking a place to rest, they approached a small house and asked its owner if they could stay overnight. As they shared their remarkable adventures, the owner informed them that no one in the Emerald City had ever seen the wonderful Wizard of Oz. He had chosen to remain unseen, and his throne had always been vacant. The next day, Dorothy and her friends made their way to the Emerald City and straight to the room of the wonderful wizard, hoping to finally meet him. However, they could only hear his powerful voice, as the wonderful wizard remained invisible. The wonderful wizard of Oz conveyed that he could only assist them if they accomplished the task of defeating the Wicked Witch of the West and bringing him her broomstick. Although frightened and disappointed by this revelation, Dorothy and her friends understood they had to undertake this challenging mission. Dorothy and her friends set off toward the castle where the Wicked Witch of the West resided. Dorothy and her friends soon discovered that the witch possessed immense strength and power, making it impossible for them to defeat her. Fortunately, an unexpected turn of events occurred when Dorothy accidentally poured water on the witch. Due to the witch's vulnerability to water, she melted and perished. With the Wicked Witch defeated, Dorothy and her friends retrieved the witch's broomstick and brought it back to the wonderful Wizard of Oz as requested. When Dorothy presented him with the broomstick, the wonderful Wizard of Oz admitted that he was not actually a wizard. In reality, he was just an ordinary circus man from Kansas who had become stranded in Oz after his balloon journey. The people in the central region of Oz mistook him for a powerful wizard because of his arrival in a balloon. They asked him to be their ruler. Since he lacked any magical abilities, he feared the wicked witches. In order to protect against them, he commanded the construction of the Emerald City. 
To maintain the illusion of being a formidable wizard, he insisted on being called the Great Wizard of Oz, and some even referred to him as the Wonderful Wizard of Oz. Upon learning that Dorothy had vanquished the Wicked Witch of the East, he felt immense joy. Hence, he requested Dorothy to defeat the Wicked Witch of the West as well. With both the Wicked Witches of the East and the West eliminated, he expressed his gratitude to Dorothy and her friends, feeling a great sense of happiness. After finishing his story, the man took some time to think. He had made a promise, and even though he wasn't a great wizard, he possessed cleverness and wisdom. He presented Scarecrow with a diploma symbolizing knowledge, fulfilling his wish for a brain. Scarecrow felt content and satisfied. For Tin Man, he offered a heart-shaped clock instead of a real heart. This gesture touched Tin Man deeply, making him happy. Cowardly Lion received a medal acknowledging his courage. The lion felt proud and as majestic as the king of the jungle. It seemed like all their desires had been fulfilled, except for Dorothy's. The man had made a genuine and devoted promise to help Dorothy return to her home in Kansas. A few days later, a large balloon was prepared for the Wizard of Oz and Dorothy to travel back to Kansas. Unfortunately, Dorothy was delayed due to her dog Toto. Dorothy felt a deep sadness as she watched the balloon ascend without her. Her disappointment was overwhelming. Then, another good witch named Glinda, the Good Witch of the South, came to see Dorothy. The Good Witch already knew how to work the magic shoes that belonged to Dorothy and were left by the Wicked Witch of the East. The Good Witch instructed Dorothy to tap her magic heels together three times while saying, There's no place like home. Following the witch's guidance, Dorothy was swiftly transported back to her home in Kansas. Now, she was filled with happiness, reunited with her aunt and uncle. She smiled and joyfully proclaimed, There's no place like home. Cinderella and the Glass Slipper Once upon a time, in a faraway kingdom, there lived a young girl named Cinderella. She was known far and wide for her kindness and her gentle nature. However, her life was not as easy as it seemed. Cinderella lived with her stepmother and two stepsisters in a small house. While Cinderella was kind and sweet, her stepsisters were quite the opposite. They were mean and selfish and often made Cinderella's life very difficult. Every day, Cinderella was given all the housework to do. She had to clean the floors, wash the dishes, and make the beds. Despite the hard work, Cinderella never complained. She believed in being kind and patient, no matter the circumstances. One of the reasons her stepsisters were so unkind to Cinderella was that she was very beautiful. They were jealous of her beauty and would often tease her for it. They would say hurtful things and make fun of her. Cinderella didn't even have a proper bed to sleep in. Her stepsisters had comfortable beds, but Cinderella had to sleep by the fireplace. She would curl up on a cold, hard floor covered in ashes. It was a difficult life for her, but she never lost her gentle spirit. One day, something exciting happened in the kingdom. A messenger arrived at Cinderella's house with a beautiful invitation. It was an invitation to a grand ball at the royal palace, and it was hosted by none other than the prince himself. Cinderella's stepsisters were overjoyed when they heard the news. They immediately started planning for the ball and asked Cinderella to help them get ready. They said, all the handsome young men in the kingdom will be at the ball, and we must look our best. Cinderella, with her kind heart, wanted to go to the ball as well. She gathered the courage to ask, can I please come to the ball? Her stepsisters, however, scolded her and said, You can't go to the ball. You have to help us get ready. Most people would have been very sad and disappointed, but not Cinderella. She agreed to help her stepsisters prepare for the ball, even though it meant more work for her. 
On the night of the ball, Cinderella worked tirelessly to help her stepsisters. She ironed their beautiful dresses, brushed their hair until it gleamed, and helped them find their matching shoes. Her stepsisters were in a hurry to leave for the ball and didn't even say thank you to Cinderella. Left all alone by the fireplace, Cinderella couldn't help but feel a little sad. She looked at her ragged clothes and sighed, I wish I could have gone to the ball. I may not have fancy clothes, but I still would have loved to go. Suddenly, there was a soft and kind voice that spoke to her. I am your fairy godmother, said the voice. Don't cry, you will go to the ball. Just do as I say. Cinderella looked around in surprise and saw an elderly lady she had never seen before. The lady had a warm and kind smile, and Cinderella felt a sense of comfort. She said, You're my very own fairy godmother. I will do as you say. Cinderella's fairy godmother instructed her to get a pumpkin from the garden. When Cinderella brought the pumpkin, her fairy godmother touched it with her magic wand. In an instant, the pumpkin transformed into a magnificent carriage. Next, her fairy godmother asked Cinderella to find a mousetrap with six white mice in it. Cinderella brought the mousetrap, and her fairy godmother used her magic to turn four of the mice into elegant white horses. The remaining two mice became the carriage's footmen. Now, Cinderella, you can go to the ball, her fairy godmother said with a smile. Cinderella was overjoyed but worried about her attire. She asked, but how can I go in these old clothes? Her fairy godmother waved her wand once more, and Cinderella's rags transformed into a stunning princess gown. On her feet, she now had delicate glass slippers. Now, my dear, go and enjoy yourself, but remember to leave the ball before the stroke of midnight, her fairy godmother warned. When the clock strikes midnight, your beautiful clothes will turn back into rags. Cinderella thanked her fairy godmother with all her heart and headed to the ball with a heart full of hope. When Cinderella arrived at the royal palace, everyone was mesmerized by her beauty. The prince himself couldn't take his eyes off her. He asked her to dance, and they twirled around the grand ballroom together. Cinderella was the happiest she had ever been. As they danced and talked, Cinderella lost track of time. She was having such a wonderful time that she didn't even notice the clock ticking. When the clock finally struck midnight, Cinderella remembered her fairy godmother's warning. In a hurry, she left the ball, but in her haste, she accidentally left behind one of her delicate glass slippers on the grand staircase. The prince tried to chase after her, but she vanished into the night. The next day, the prince was determined to find the beautiful girl from the ball. He had fallen in love with her, and he wanted to make her his bride. He sent his messengers all over the kingdom with one task, to find the owner of the glass slipper. The messengers arrived at Cinderella's house, and her stepsisters eagerly tried to squeeze their feet into the tiny glass slipper. But it was no use, the slipper was too small for them. Curious, the messenger asked Cinderella, why don't you try it on? One of her stepsisters replied, it won't fit her, and besides, she wasn't at the ball. To their astonishment, the glass slipper fit Cinderella perfectly. Her stepsisters were in disbelief. They had no idea that their kind and gentle stepsister was the mysterious beauty from the ball. Just as they were about to leave, Cinderella's fairy godmother appeared once more. With a wave of her wand, she made Cinderella look even more beautiful than before. The messengers took Cinderella to the royal palace. When the prince saw Cinderella, he was overjoyed. He knew he had found the girl he had been searching for. He asked her to marry him, and Cinderella happily agreed. Soon, a grand wedding was held at the royal palace. Cinderella's stepsisters, who had treated her so poorly, were invited to the wedding. Cinderella had forgiven them and wanted to share her happiness with them. 
As Cinderella and the prince exchanged their vows, there was a sense of true love and happiness in the air. Cinderella's kindness had led her to a life of love and happiness, and she had finally found her happily ever after. And so, Cinderella's story became known throughout the kingdom as a tale of kindness, courage, and the belief that goodness always triumphs in the end. She proved that no matter how difficult life may be, a kind heart can lead to a fairy tale ending. Goldilocks and the Three Bears Once upon a time, in a cozy cottage nestled deep within the woods, there lived a family of three bears, Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby Bear. They were a happy family, and their home was filled with love and warmth. One fine morning, Mama Bear decided to make some porridge for breakfast. She carefully cooked three bowls of delicious porridge. One big bowl for Papa Bear, a medium-sized bowl for Mama Bear, and a small bowl for Baby Bear. But as the porridge was still steaming hot, the bears decided to go for a walk in the woods while it cooled down. While the bears were away, a mischievous little girl named Goldilocks happened upon their cottage. Curiosity got the better of her, and she couldn't resist exploring the open door. She stepped inside and found herself in the bear's cozy living room. As she looked around, she noticed the three bowls of porridge on the table. Goldilocks was feeling hungry after her long walk, so she decided to help herself to the porridge. She first tasted the porridge from Papa Bear's big bowl, but it was much too hot for her tongue. She then tried Mama Bear's medium-sized bowl but found it to be too cold. Finally, she tasted the porridge in Baby Bear's small bowl, and it was just right. Goldilocks happily finished up Baby Bear's porridge. With her hunger satisfied, Goldilocks moved to the next room where she found three chairs. She first sat on Papa Bear's big chair, but it was too hard and uncomfortable. Then she tried Mama Bear's medium-sized chair but it was too soft and made her feel as though she might sink. Finally, she sat on Baby Bear's small chair, and it was just right. But as she settled in, the chair couldn't bear her weight and broke into pieces. Not bothered by the broken chair, Goldilocks decided to explore upstairs. She found three beds in the bedroom, and without hesitation, she laid down on Papa Bear's big bed. It was far too firm for her liking. She then tried Mama Bear's medium-sized bed, but it was too soft and lumpy. Finally, she laid down on Baby Bear's small bed, and it was just right. The bed was so comfortable that she quickly drifted off to sleep. Meanwhile, the three bears returned from their walk, only to discover that someone had been inside their home. Papa Bear growled in anger, Mama Bear looked around in surprise, and Baby Bear cried out in distress. They realized that someone had tasted their porridge, sat in their chairs, and slept in their beds. As they entered the bedroom, Goldilocks woke up to the sight of three furious bears staring at her. She shrieked in fright, quickly jumped out of Baby Bear's bed, and ran downstairs. The bears chased after her, but Goldilocks managed to escape through the front door just in time. From that day forward, Goldilocks learned her lesson about entering others' homes without permission. And as for the bears, they always made sure to eat their porridge, sit in their chairs, and sleep in their beds together as a family. The Adventure of Little Red Riding Hood Once upon a time, there was a little girl who was loved by everyone because she was kind and beautiful. Her grandmother was especially fond of her. The grandmother made her a small red cloak and hood, and because of this, everyone called her Little Red Riding Hood. One day, Little Red Riding Hood's mother asked her to take a basket with butter, eggs, and a freshly baked cake to her sick grandmother. Little Red Riding Hood, who was always eager to help, immediately went to get her red cloak. She took her basket and started her journey. While she was walking to her grandmother's house, she met a wolf. The wolf wanted to eat her, but he couldn't because there were woodcutters nearby. The wolf greeted her and said, Good morning, Little Red Riding Hood. Where are you going so early? Little Red Riding Hood was innocent and didn't know it was dangerous to talk to a wolf. She replied, I'm going to visit my grandmother. 
She's sick in bed, and I'm bringing her butter, eggs, and a cake that my mother made. The wolf asked, where does your grandmother live? She lives in a little white cottage on the other side of the woods, answered Red Riding Hood. The wolf said, well, I'm going that way too. If you let me, I can walk with you for part of the way. Little Red Riding Hood didn't suspect any harm and agreed to let the wolf accompany her. In a few minutes, Little Red Riding Hood stopped to pick wildflowers for her grandmother. Meanwhile, the wolf came up with a clever plan to capture the little girl and have her for dinner. He said, Little Red Riding Hood, I'm in a hurry. We have to go our separate ways now. Goodbye, and quickly trotted away. As soon as the wolf was out of Little Red Riding Hood's sight, he started running as fast as he could. In a short while, he arrived at the grandmother's cottage and knocked on the door. Who's there? asked the elderly grandmother from her bed. It's Little Red Riding Hood, replied the wolf in a gentle voice. He pretended to sound like Little Red Riding Hood and added, I've brought you butter, eggs, and a freshly baked cake that my mother made for you. Pull the secret door cord, and the latch will lift, instructed the old grandmother. So the wolf pulled the door cord and opened the door. Without hesitation, the wolf pounced on the poor old grandmother and devoured her in an instant. Afterwards, the wolf put on the grandmother's nightcap, climbed into bed, and lay down, patiently waiting for Little Red Riding Hood. Soon, there was a soft knock on the door. Who's there? called the wolf, mimicking the grandmother's voice. It's Little Red Riding Hood, dear grandmother. I've brought you butter, eggs, and a freshly baked cake that my mother made for you. Using a disguised voice, the wolf responded, Pull the secret door cord, and the latch will lift. So, Little Red Riding Hood pulled the door cord and entered the cottage. Good morning, dear grandmother, she said. How are you feeling today? I feel very bad, my dear, answered the wolf. He tried to hide under the bedclothes. You sound strange and hoarse, grandmother, said the little girl. I have a bad cold, my dear, said the wicked wolf. The little girl noticed how strange her grandmother's eyes looked in her nightclothes. She continued, Grandmother, why do you have such big eyes? So, I can see you better, my dear, said the wolf. Grandmother, why do you have such big ears? So, I can hear you better, my child. Grandmother, why do you have such long arms? So, I can hug you better, my dear. As Little Red Riding Hood looked at the big mouth and teeth of the wolf, she started to get scared. But, Grandmother, why do you have such great big teeth? said the girl. Because I can eat you up with my big teeth, roared the wolf. The wolf suddenly jumped out of bed and grabbed poor Little Red Riding Hood. He was just about to eat her when there was a loud noise outside. The door burst open, and several woodcutters rushed in. They had seen the wolf talking to the little girl in the woods and got worried, so they came to see what mischief he was up to. They killed the wicked wolf right away. Little Red Riding Hood was saved. She ran home to tell her mother all about her terrible adventure. Little Red Riding Hood's mom told her, Don't talk to people you don't know, and don't share personal information with them. Peter Pan of Neverland Peter Pan and Tinkerbell, a friendly fairy, was the best friend. One day, Tinkerbell flew into a house in London. Later on, Peter Pan discovered that Tinkerbell was actually in that very house in London. To reunite with his fairy friend, Tinkerbell, Peter Pan made up his mind to visit the bedroom of three children who lived in London, Wendy, John, and Michael Darling. When Peter Pan arrived, he found the children fast asleep in their cozy beds, lost in dreamland. Carefully, he explored the room until he finally spotted Tinkerbell, glowing softly in the moonlight. However, just as Peter Pan and Tinkerbell were preparing to leave the house, the three children suddenly woke up from their slumber. 
wide-eyed and amazed, the children couldn't believe what they were seeing, Peter Pan and Tinkerbell right in front of them. Out of curiosity, Peter Pan felt a strong desire to learn more about these children. He decided to use his magical abilities to make them truly believe in the existence of fairies, hoping to spark their imagination and wonder. Peter Pan took a handful of magical fairy dust and sprinkled it gently over the heads of the children. Then he whispered to them, close your eyes and think about the things that make you the happiest. If you do, something incredible will happen. To their great surprise, the children suddenly discovered that they were able to fly. They felt weightless and free as they soared through the air alongside Peter Pan. Peter Pan, with a mischievous grin, became their guide on a remarkable journey through the vast skies to a place called Neverland. Neverland was a truly enchanting and magnificent land, brimming with endless adventures and astonishing marvels. In this extraordinary realm, one could encounter daring pirates, mesmerizing mermaids, delightful fairies, and various other mystical creatures. Each corner of Neverland was filled with magic and wonder, providing a never-ending source of excitement. However, the most marvelous part of Neverland was the presence of the Lost Boys. They were a special group of boys who, like the children, had also discovered their ability to fly and had flown to Neverland. Once there, they found a home they never wanted to leave, as they enjoyed the joy and freedom that the land offered. Peter Pan took on the important role of leading the Lost Boys, and he made sure to show Wendy, John, and Michael every corner of the island, leaving no place unexplored. Together, they embarked on exciting adventures, entering caves, climbing trees, and engaging in playful games that filled their days with joy. But their time in Neverland was not all fun and games. Peter Pan and the Lost Boys had to face off against the wicked Captain Hook and his gang of menacing pirates. The wicked Captain Hook and his crew were relentless in their pursuit of capturing them. In this magical land, there resided a notorious pirate known as Captain Hook, who commanded a crew of rough and formidable pirates, sailing the vast seas. Captain Hook's appearance was distinct, as he wore a large hat and a lengthy coat. Notably, his hand had been replaced with a hook due to a crocodile's bite that had occurred long ago. Interestingly, the crocodile had also swallowed a ticking clock, causing Captain Hook to live in constant fear, as the sound of the clock's tick-tock could be heard whenever the crocodile approached. Captain Hook and his pirate crew had a big ship named the Jolly Roger. They sailed the seas in search of treasure and mischief, but their main goal was to capture Peter Pan. Captain Hook felt intense envy towards Peter due to his ability to fly and his eternal youth, and he desired to conquer him. Every time Peter Pan and the Lost Boys spotted the approaching Jolly Roger ship, they understood that Captain Hook and his crew were after them. However, Peter Pan possessed great courage and intelligence, consistently outwitting Hook and his pirates. Peter and his companions engaged in numerous battles against the pirates. Though they occasionally encountered difficulties, they always emerged victorious. Thus, despite the intimidating presence of Captain Hook and his pirate crew, Peter Pan and his friends continuously triumphed over them through their bravery and cleverness. One sunny day, when Peter Pan wasn't around, Captain Hook and his pirate gang captured Wendy and her brothers. They were brought aboard the Jolly Roger, where Captain Hook eagerly awaited their arrival. Captain Hook was overjoyed to have finally captured Peter Pan's closest companion. Wendy felt very frightened, but she tried her best to show bravery. She stood up to Captain Hook and refused to let him intimidate her. Captain Hook was impressed by her courage and decided to appoint her as his personal storyteller. Captain Hook had already learned that Wendy had a great love for storytelling. He believed that if she shared stories with him every night, he might not feel as scared of the dark. At first, Wendy didn't feel like sharing stories with Hook and his crew, but then she felt that she could see an opportunity to escape while she was telling stories. Therefore, she began narrating the tale of Peter Pan and his thrilling adventures in Neverland. As she spun the story, Wendy cleverly dropped hints to guide her brothers on how to break free. Wendy successfully diverted Captain Hook's attention long enough for them to make their getaway. When Hook realized what had occurred, he became livid with anger. He made another attempt to capture them, but with the assistance of Peter Pan and Tinkerbell, they managed to soar away. Since that day, Wendy grew even braver and more self-assured. She demonstrated that even in perilous situations, she could remain composed and utilize her intellect to outweigh her adversaries. 
One fine day, in order to rescue Wendy, Peter Pan flew over to where Captain Hook and his pirates were standing, and he challenged Captain Hook to a duel. Captain Hook was thrilled at the opportunity to finally defeat Peter Pan once and for all. They engaged in combat, but Peter's quickness and agility allowed him to evade Hook's attacks. Meanwhile, Wendy took advantage of their fight and quietly sneaked away. She understood the importance of returning to the Lost Boys' hideout before the pirates discovered her. She sprinted as fast as she could, making an effort to remain silent so as not to alert the pirates. Eventually, she reached the hideout where the Lost Boys eagerly awaited her arrival. They were all greatly relieved to see her, and their cheers filled the air upon hearing that Peter Pan had successfully diverted Captain Hook and his crew. Ultimately, the battle between Peter and Hook remained undecided, and both of them withdrew. Nevertheless, Wendy was safe, and she knew that she owed her rescue to Peter Pan. She felt a deep sense of gratitude for his assistance. She was certain that she would forever cherish the memories of their extraordinary adventure on the enchanting island of Neverland. One bright day, Peter Pan and his pals, the Lost Boys, were having fun in the forest when they heard a lot of noise from the nearby beach. They flew over to see what was going on and discovered that Captain Hook and his pirate gang had arrived on the shore. Now, Peter Pan and the Lost Boys found themselves in a battle against Captain Hook and his pirates. They were in the midst of a war. Captain Hook was boiling with anger towards Peter Pan, who always ruined his plans. He was determined to conquer Peter once and for all. He challenged Peter Pan to a fight, and Peter bravely accepted. The two adversaries began their duel, but Captain Hook couldn't match Peter's speed and agility. Peter zoomed around him, playfully making a mockery of Captain Hook's attempts. As Captain Hook grew more and more furious, Peter Pan seemed to be having the time of his life. After a long and intense battle, Peter disarmed Captain Hook, causing him to tumble into the sea. The pirates were surprised and quickly started to run away, realizing they couldn't beat Peter and the Lost Boys. But Peter Pan wasn't ready to stop. He flew to the Jolly Roger ship, where Captain Hook was hiding, and challenged him to a final duel. Captain Hook felt hesitant, but he couldn't refuse a challenge. They resumed fighting. However, this time, Peter Pan had an even stronger determination to defeat Captain Hook. In the end, Peter's persistence paid off. He managed to overpower Hook and make him lose consciousness. The pirates were defeated. Peter Pan and his friends emerged as the winners. Since that day, Peter and his companions could freely explore the wonders of Neverland without worrying about being attacked by Captain Hook and his crew. Peter Pan knew he had triumphed, and he felt proud of his courage and abilities. When it came to Wendy, even though Wendy was having a great time, she started to miss her mom and dad. She longed for the loving hugs and the cozy feeling of their home. Therefore, she made the decision to go back to London. Peter Pan felt very sad upon hearing this, but he understood that Wendy was making the right choice. Peter Pan assisted Wendy and her brothers in flying back to their home in London. Upon their arrival, Wendy and her brothers were met with immense joy from their parents. The children embraced their mom and dad tightly, sharing all the exciting tales of their adventures. They recounted stories of Neverland and the thrilling experiences they had with Peter and the Lost Boys. Although they had grown a little older, the memories of Neverland never left their hearts. They would forever remember their time in Neverland. Rapunzel with Golden Hair Once, there was a couple who wanted to have a baby very much, but they couldn't. The woman started to think that maybe her wish would come true, and she hoped that God would make it happen. The couple had a little window at the back of their house, and they could see a beautiful garden from there. It had the most amazing flowers and herbs, but it was surrounded by a tall wall. Everyone was afraid to go inside because it belonged to a powerful witch who scared everyone. One day, the woman was standing by the window and looking at the garden. She saw a plant called Rapunzel that looked so fresh and colorful. She wanted to eat it so badly. Her desire for it grew so strong that she started to get pale and unhappy. Her husband saw her and asked, What's bothering you, my dear wife? She said, Oh, I wish I could have some of that Rapunzel from the garden behind our house. Otherwise, I feel like I will die. Her husband loved her so much that he couldn't stand to see her suffering. 
he decided, I'll do whatever it takes to get her some Rapunzel. At twilight, he climbed over the wall into the witch's garden. He quickly grabbed a handful of Rapunzel and brought it to his wife. She made a salad out of it and ate it greedily. It tasted so incredibly good that the next day she wanted even more. Her husband had to go back to the garden again. But this time, as he reached the bottom of the wall, he saw the witch standing there. She was angry and said, How dare you enter my garden and steal my Rapunzel like a thief? You'll face the consequences. He pleaded with her, Please have mercy on us. My wife saw your Rapunzel from the window and wanted it so badly that she would have died if she didn't taste it. The witch listened to him and let go of her anger. The witch said, If that's really the case, I'll allow you to take as much Rapunzel as you need. But you have to promise me that you'll give me the child your wife will have. I'll take care of the child, and it will be like my own. The man was terrified but agreed to the witch's condition. When his wife gave birth, the witch appeared, named the baby Rapunzel, and took her away. Rapunzel grew up to be a very beautiful girl. When she turned twelve, the witch locked her in a tall tower deep in the forest. The tower had no doors or stairs, only a small window at the top. Whenever the witch wanted to visit Rapunzel, she would stand below the window and say, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair to me. Rapunzel had long and beautiful golden hair. When she heard the witch's voice, she would undo her braided hair, let it hang out of the window, and the witch would climb up using it. After a year or two, a prince rode through the forest and heard Rapunzel singing. He was enchanted by her voice and stopped to listen. He wanted to meet her, so he searched for a way to get inside the tower. But he couldn't find any doors or stairs. However, the prince didn't give up. He kept coming back to the tower and listened to Rapunzel's songs. One day, he saw the witch coming and heard her call out for Rapunzel to let down her hair. The prince got an idea. The next day, he went to the tower and called out the same words, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair to me. Rapunzel did just that. She let her long hair down, and the prince climbed up. At first, Rapunzel was scared because she had never seen a man before. But the prince spoke kindly to her, and she realized he was a friend. He told her that her singing had touched his heart, and he couldn't find peace until he saw her. Rapunzel felt happy and agreed to marry the prince. She asked him how they could get her out of the tower. They made a plan. The prince would bring silk every time he visited, and Rapunzel would weave a ladder with it. When the ladder was ready, she would climb down, and the prince would take her away on his horse. They decided to keep their meetings a secret because the witch only came during the day. The witch didn't know about them until one day when Rapunzel asked her why she was heavier to pull up than the prince. The witch got angry and cut off Rapunzel's hair. But the witch used Rapunzel's cut hair to trick the prince. When he called out, thinking Rapunzel was there, the witch showed up and laughed at him. She said Rapunzel was gone and he would never see her again. The prince was devastated. He couldn't bear the pain, so he jumped from the tower. He survived the fall but got blinded by thorns on the ground. He wandered in the forest, eating roots and berries, and crying for his lost love. Many years passed, and one day, the prince arrived in a desert where Rapunzel lived. He heard a familiar voice and followed it. When he reached Rapunzel, they hugged and cried tears of joy. Rapunzel's tears touched the prince's eyes, and he could see again. They went back to the prince's kingdom, where they were welcomed with happiness. They lived together happily ever after. Snow White and Seven Dwarfs Once upon a time, there was a queen who had a lovely daughter with skin as white as snow. Her name was Snow White. The kind queen fell ill and passed away shortly after. The king married a new queen, but she was a bad person. This wicked queen used to ask her magic mirror. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? My queen, you are the fairest of all, the magic mirror always replied. Little Snow White became even more beautiful as time went by.
One day, the magic mirror said, My queen, Princess Snow White is more beautiful than you. The evil queen got angry and ordered her hunter to take Snow White to the woods. In the woods, Snow White begged the hunter to save her life. Please, hunter, save me. I'll go into the woods and never come home again. After a long walk, she found a small cottage and went inside. There, she discovered small things, seven small chairs, plates, knives, forks, cups, and beds. Since she was very hungry, thirsty, and tired, she ate some food, drank water, and went to sleep. In the evening, seven dwarfs returned home and found Snow White sleeping. Snow White told them how she got there, and soon, they all became good friends. Snow White told them how she got there, and soon, they all became good friends. Now, when the seven dwarfs went to work, Snow White stayed in the cottage alone. One day, the evil queen asked her magic mirror again, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? The mirror replied, My queen, you're beautiful, but Snow White is even more beautiful. The queen became angrier because Snow White was still alive. So, she decided to kill Snow White with a poisoned apple. The queen dressed up as an old farmer and went to the cottage, shouting, Apples for sale. Buy some apples. The queen asked Snow White to take a bite of the apple, and when she did, she fell to the floor. When the dwarfs returned home, they saw Snow White lying on the floor. They thought she was dead, but her appearance didn't change. So, they decided to put her in a glass case instead of burying her. Oh no! Is she no longer alive? The dwarfs were very sad and couldn't stop crying. A prince from a nearby land happened to pass by. He saw Snow White in the glass case. Snow White caught the prince's romantic interest. Can I take this princess to my kingdom? Asterisk. Of course, the dwarfs agreed. They tried to lift Snow White's coffin but accidentally dropped it. Snow White's mouth opened and a piece of apple fell out. Wait, where am I? Snow White slowly opened her eyes. Hooray! The princess is awake. Princess Snow White has awakened. The seven dwarfs were overjoyed. My beautiful princess, will you marry me? asked the prince as he approached Snow White. Yes, my lord, Snow White replied. I will. So, the prince married Snow White, and they lived happily ever after. The Gobi Desert The Gobi Desert is a big sandy place on our planet Earth. It is located in Asia, in countries called China and Mongolia. People from all over the world are curious about the Gobi Desert because it's a very special and unique place. The Gobi Desert is not like the forests or the parks we see with lots of trees and grass. It's not very wet like those places. Instead, it's very dry and often hot. But did you know that even though it's a desert, sometimes it can be really cold too? The Gobi Desert is known for its big sand dunes that can look like mountains of sand. Some parts of the Gobi Desert have rocks, and some parts are flat like a big table. Even though it might seem hard to believe, the Gobi Desert is home to some special plants and animals. Some plants in the Gobi Desert can survive with very little water. They are like nature's superheroes. There are also animals like the Bactrian camel that can live in the harsh conditions of the desert. The Gobi Desert is like a puzzle with all these interesting pieces of life. The Gobi Desert has interesting weather. During the day, when the sun is up, it can get really hot. It's like standing close to a fire. But when the sun goes away and it's nighttime, the Gobi Desert can become very cold. It's like the desert gets a little bit chilly. This happens because the desert doesn't hold on to heat very well. So it cools down quickly at night. People have lived in the Gobi Desert for a very long time. They have learned how to survive in this tough environment. Some people are experts at finding water, 
and they used special animals called camels to help them carry heavy things across the desert. These people are like heroes because they know how to live in a place that can be quite challenging. In recent times, scientists and adventurers have gone to the Gobi Desert to learn more about its secrets. They have found ancient dinosaur bones and other fossils buried in the desert sand. People also visit the Gobi Desert to experience its unique landscapes and learn about its history and culture. Just like we take care of our homes, we should also take care of the Gobi Desert. It's important to be kind to the environment and not do things that can harm it. Building and digging too much can hurt the desert. By being careful and respectful, we can help keep the Gobi Desert healthy and beautiful. The Gobi Desert is a special place full of mysteries and wonders. It might be dry, but it's also full of life and stories. Exploring the Gobi Desert helps us learn about the diversity of our planet and how people and nature can adapt to challenging conditions. It's a desert of surprises waiting to be discovered by curious adventurers. New York Welcome to New York City, a big and exciting city that has lots of amazing things to see and do. New York City, often referred to as the Big Apple, stands as a symbol of ambition, diversity, and opportunity. New York is a place where people from all over the world come to experience the unique mix of history, culture, and fun. New York City is an incredible place with so much to offer. From the thrilling shows on Broadway to the breathtaking views from the Empire State Building and the historic significance of the Statue of Liberty, there's something for everyone to enjoy. Come and explore the wonders of New York City, and let the magic of this vibrant metropolis leave a lasting impression on your heart and mind. In this article, we'll take a special tour of some famous places in New York City that you don't want to miss. Let's get started on our adventure. The Statue of Liberty The Statue of Liberty is a very important and famous landmark in New York City. The Statue of Liberty was given to the United States as a gift from France in 1886 and it represents freedom and democracy. The statue stands on Liberty Island, and it's made of copper. It's very tall and you can see it from many places in the city. If you want, you can take a ferry to the island and go inside the statue to see the view from the top. The statue was designed by a French sculptor. And it was made in France. Then, it was shipped to the United States in many pieces and put back together on Liberty Island. The Statue of Liberty is also a symbol of hope and freedom for people all over the world. Many people who came to the United States in the past, like immigrants, saw the statue when they arrived. It made them feel welcome and happy. So, the Statue of Liberty is not just a big and beautiful statue, it's also a symbol of hope, freedom, and a new beginning for people who come to the United States. I hope you have a chance to see it and learn more about its history and meaning. Times Square Welcome to the heart of New York City. Times Square This is a special place in New York City that is very famous and lots of people come here to visit. Also known as, the crossroads of the world, Times Square is one of the most famous tourist destinations in the world and a must-see for any visitor to New York. In Times Square, you'll see many bright lights and big signs. As you walk through Times Square, you will be amazed by the bright lights, billboards, and energy that surrounds you. There are also theaters where you can watch shows and performances. You can see world-renowned theaters, like the Broadway, that offer some of the best shows and performances in the world. You can also go shopping here and find many different things to buy. The area is also a shopping hub with a variety of stores and shops that cater to different tastes and budgets. You can find souvenirs, electronics, clothing, and much more here. One of the most iconic aspects of Times Square is its New Year's Eve celebration. Times Square is famous for its New Year's Eve celebration. Every year, many people come here to watch a big ball drop and start the new year. Hundreds of thousands of people gather to watch the famous ball drop and bring in the new year. You can experience the excitement of this celebration all year round by visiting the New Year's Eve Ball, which is on display in Times Square year-round. In addition to its shopping and entertainment options, 
Times Square is also a hub for transportation, making it easy to get around the city and visit other popular destinations. Whether you're a first-time visitor or a returning traveler, Times Square is sure to leave a lasting impression on you. I hope you enjoy your time in Times Square, and I am here to help you make the most of your visit. So, take a walk, take some photos, and soak up the energy and excitement of this unique and unforgettable destination. Broadway Broadway is a famous street in New York City, located in the borough of Manhattan. It is known for its many theaters, where people can watch live performances of musicals and plays. Broadway shows are some of the most popular tourist attractions in New York, attracting millions of visitors every year. The history of Broadway can be traced back to the late 1700s, when the first theaters were built in the area. Over the years, Broadway has become a center for the performing arts, and many famous actors, musicians, and directors have worked on its stages. Today, Broadway is home to over 40 theaters, with more than 20,000 seats between them. Visitors to Broadway can see a variety of shows, including musicals, plays, and comedy acts. Some of the most famous musicals on Broadway include The Lion King, Wicked, and The Phantom of the Opera. Many of these shows are based on popular books, movies, and other works and feature original music and lyrics. One of the best things about Broadway shows is that they offer something for everyone. Whether you are a fan of drama, comedy, or music, you are sure to find a show that appeals to your tastes. Many Broadway shows are suitable for families, and many offer matinee performances on weekends, making them a great option for families with young children. When planning your trip to Broadway, it is important to consider the time of year. Some shows are more popular during certain times of the year. Broadway shows are some of the most popular tourist attractions in New York, attracting millions of visitors every year. So, it is a good idea to book your tickets in advance to ensure that you get the seats you want. You can purchase tickets online, or from the box office of the theater where the show is playing. In addition to the theaters, there are many other attractions on Broadway that you can visit. For example, there are many shops, restaurants, and cafes in the area, as well as a number of historical landmarks and cultural institutions. Some popular attractions on Broadway include Times Square, the New York Public Library, and the Empire State Building. Overall, Broadway is a must-see destination for anyone visiting New York City. With its rich history, world-class theaters, and wide range of attractions, it is sure to provide you with a memorable and entertaining experience. Whether you are a fan of theater, music, or simply enjoy exploring new places, Broadway is a destination that you won't want to miss. Brooklyn Bridge Brooklyn Bridge is a suspension bridge that spans the East River and connects the boroughs of Manhattan and Brooklyn in New York City. It is one of the oldest and most famous bridges in the world and is a beloved landmark of New York City and a symbol of American engineering and innovation. Brooklyn Bridge was completed in 1883 and was the first suspension bridge to use steel wire for its cables. This groundbreaking design allowed the bridge to be much stronger and longer than previous suspension bridges. The bridge was also a crucial link in the development of the New York City transportation system connecting the two boroughs and providing easy access for people and goods. Brooklyn Bridge is one of the most recognizable landmarks of New York City and is a popular destination for tourists and locals alike. The bridge offers stunning views of the city skyline, the East River, and the surrounding neighborhoods, and is a popular spot for taking photos and enjoying the sights and sounds of the city. Visitors to Brooklyn Bridge can take a walk or bike ride across the bridge to experience its beauty and significance up close. The pedestrian walkway is located above the car lanes and offers panoramic views of the city, while the bike lane provides a convenient way to get from one borough to the other. In addition to its engineering and transportation significance, Brooklyn Bridge is also a cultural and historical landmark. The bridge has been featured in numerous movies and TV shows and has been the site of many important events and demonstrations throughout its history. Brooklyn Bridge is also a symbol of the resilience and determination of the people of New York City, who have faced and overcome many challenges throughout the city's history. 
visitors to Brooklyn Bridge can also take a guided tour of the bridge to learn more about its history and significance. These tours are led by knowledgeable guides who share the stories and legends behind this iconic landmark, as well as its role in the development of New York City and the world. Overall, Brooklyn Bridge is a must-visit destination for anyone traveling to New York City. Whether you're a seasoned traveler or simply a curious adventurer, the beauty and significance of this iconic bridge is sure to leave a lasting impression. So come explore this landmark and discover the many wonders of Brooklyn Bridge for yourself. Manhattan Manhattan is a bustling and vibrant island located in New York City. It is the most famous and iconic of the five boroughs that make up New York City. Boroughs are independent areas in NYC. Manhattan is also known for its iconic skyline, diverse cultures, and rich history. Manhattan is home to many of the world's most famous landmarks, including the Empire State Building, Central Park, the Statue of Liberty, and Times Square. These popular tourist destinations draw millions of visitors each year, making Manhattan one of the most visited places in the world. One of the most recognizable aspects of Manhattan is its iconic skyline with towering skyscrapers and the Empire State Building being the most recognizable. The Empire State Building is a 102-story skyscraper that was completed in 1931 and was the tallest building in the world until 1970. It is now one of the most popular tourist attractions in the city and offers stunning views of the city from its observation deck on the 86th floor. Another famous landmark in Manhattan is Central Park a large public park that covers over 843 acres in the center of the island. Central Park is a green oasis in the heart of the city and is a popular destination for locals and tourists alike. Central Park offers a wide range of recreational activities, including walking and biking paths, playgrounds, lakes, and gardens. The Statue of Liberty is located on Liberty Island just off the coast of Manhattan. The Statue of Liberty is a famous symbol of freedom and democracy. The statue was a gift from the people of France to the United States and was dedicated in 1886. Times Square is another iconic part of Manhattan and is one of the busiest and most vibrant areas in the city. Times Square is known for its bright lights, billboards, and bustling crowds. Times Square and is a popular destination for shopping, dining, and entertainment. Manhattan is also known for its diverse cultures and neighborhoods, each with its own unique personality and charm. From the trendy boutiques and cafes to the colorful street vendors and vibrant music scene of Harlem, there is something for everyone in Manhattan. In addition to its famous landmarks, Manhattan is also home to many of the world's top museums, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the American Museum of Natural History, and the Museum of Modern Art. These museums showcase some of the world's most important art and cultural artifacts and are must-visit destinations for anyone interested in art and history. Overall, Manhattan is a place of excitement, history, and diversity, and is a must-visit destination for anyone coming to New York City. Whether you're a first-time visitor or a seasoned traveler, there is always something new to discover in this iconic and vibrant island. Central Park Central Park is a large public park located in the heart of Manhattan, New York City. It is one of the most famous and beloved parks in the world, attracting millions of visitors each year. Covering over 843 acres, Central Park offers a peaceful escape from the hustle and bustle of the city. It is a popular destination for locals and tourists alike. One of the most recognizable features of Central Park is its lush green landscape, which includes rolling hills, lush meadows, and a variety of trees and plants. The park is also home to several bodies of water, including the Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Reservoir, the Pond, and the Bow Bridge. These features provide a peaceful and picturesque backdrop for visitors to enjoy. Another popular feature of Central Park is its many walking and biking paths, which provide visitors with a chance to explore the park's diverse landscape. The park also offers a wide range of recreational activities, including playgrounds, sports fields, and the Central Park Zoo. The zoo is home to a variety of animals, including polar bears, sea lions, and monkeys, and is a popular destination for families and children. 
Central Park is also home to many of the city's top cultural institutions, including the Central Park Conservatory Garden, the Shakespeare Garden, and the Central Park Wildlife Center. These institutions provide visitors with an opportunity to learn about the park's history and cultural significance, as well as to enjoy its natural beauty. In addition to its many recreational and cultural attractions, Central Park is also a popular destination for events and performances. The park is home to the iconic Summer Stage, an outdoor performance venue that hosts concerts, theater productions, and dance performances throughout the year. The park is also a popular location for outdoor movie screenings, festivals, and other events. Visitors to Central Park can also take a guided tour of the park to learn more about its history and significance. These tours are led by knowledgeable guides who share the stories and legends behind the park's many landmarks and attractions. Overall, Central Park is an iconic and beloved part of New York City, offering visitors a chance to escape the city's fast pace and enjoy its natural beauty and cultural richness. Whether you're a local or a tourist, there is always something new to discover and enjoy in this world-famous park. Wall Street Wall Street is a street located in Lower Manhattan, New York City, and is widely considered to be the heart of the financial district. Wall Street is a street located in Lower Manhattan, New York City, and is widely considered to be the heart of the financial district. It is the home of the New York Stock Exchange, which is called NYSE. NYSE is the largest stock exchange in the world, and is a symbol of American capitalism and financial power. Wall Street has a long and storied history that dates back to the late 17th century, when it was originally a wall built by the Dutch to protect their colony from attack. Over time, the area surrounding the wall grew into a thriving business and financial center, with many banks, insurance companies, and stockbrokers setting up shop in the area. The New York Stock Exchange is one of the most recognizable landmarks on Wall Street and is the center of the American financial industry. The NYSE is where stocks, bonds, and other securities are traded, and it is the place where companies come to raise capital and where investors come to buy and sell shares. The trading floor of the NYSE is a busy and frenzied place, with traders shouting and gesturing as they buy and sell stocks. Another landmark on Wall Street is the Charging Bull statue, which is located near the NYSE and is a symbol of American financial strength and prosperity. The bull is a bronze statue that depicts a bull charging forward, and it is a popular destination for tourists who come to take photos and touch its nose for good luck. Wall Street is also home to several other financial institutions and businesses, including the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the NASDAQ, the world's second-largest stock exchange. These institutions and businesses play a crucial role in the global economy and Wall Street is where many of the important financial decisions that shape the world are made. In addition to its financial significance, Wall Street is also an important cultural and historical destination. The area is home to many iconic buildings, including the New York Stock Exchange Building, the Federal Hall National Memorial, and the Charging Bull Statue. These landmarks provide visitors with a glimpse into the rich history and cultural heritage of Wall Street and the financial district. Visitors to Wall Street can take a guided tour of the financial district to learn more about its history and significance. These tours are led by knowledgeable guides who provide insights into the workings of the financial industry, as well as the history and cultural significance of the area. Overall, Wall Street is an important and influential part of the American and global financial landscape, and a visit to this iconic street is a must for anyone interested in the world of finance and business. Whether you're a seasoned investor or simply a curious traveler, there's always something new and interesting to learn and discover on Wall Street. The Empire State Building The Empire State Building is one of the most famous and iconic landmarks in New York City. It's a very tall building and it's located in Midtown Manhattan. The Empire State Building was built in the 1930s and was the tallest building in the world for many years. It's still one of the tallest today, and it's a popular place for tourists to visit. If you go to the Empire State Building, you can take an elevator to the top and see the amazing view of the city. From up there, you can see all of Manhattan and even beyond. 
On a clear day, you can see for miles and it's a truly spectacular view. The Empire State Building is also famous for its lights. At night, the building is lit up in different colors to celebrate different holidays and events. It's a beautiful sight to see, especially when viewed from a distance. In short, the Empire State Building is a must-visit for anyone visiting New York City. It's a symbol of the city's history and its status as a world-class city. Macbeth by William Shakespeare Once, there was a province governor named Macbeth who lived in Scotland while King Duncan was in charge. Macbeth was a brave and respected leader known for winning battles. One day, after a successful fight, Macbeth and his friend Banquo came across three strange female figures on a lonely heath. These figures looked like women but had weird features like beards and a spooky appearance. When Macbeth went closer, the strange figures motioned for him to be quiet by putting their fingers on their lips. The first figure called him the Governor of Glamis, which was Macbeth's current title. It didn't surprise him. Then the second figure called him the Governor of Cotter, a title that Macbeth didn't have now. This amazed him. Finally, the third figure said that Macbeth would become the future King of Scotland. The figures circled and pointed to Banquo, Macbeth's friend, and said that he shall become the father of future kings. Macbeth was shocked and confused by these predictions because he was only the governor of Glamis, not the governor of Cotter. He also knew that the king's sons were next in line for the throne. When Macbeth tried to ask more, the figures suddenly vanished into thin air, showing their true magical nature. Just as Macbeth and Banquo were trying to understand what had happened, messengers arrived from the king. They told Macbeth that he had been made the governor of Cotter, which matched the witch's prophecy. Macbeth was amazed by this supernatural event and started to think that maybe the witch's third prediction could also come true. Returning to his castle, Macbeth shared the witch's prophecy with his wife, Lady Macbeth. She was ambitious and didn't care about right or wrong as long as they could gain power and become important. Lady Macbeth urged Macbeth, who felt guilty and unsure about committing murder, to believe that killing the king was necessary to achieve their ambitions. During that time, King Duncan decided to visit Macbeth's castle with his sons, Malcolm and Denalbin, and some nobles. The castle was in a beautiful location with fresh air, and luxurious. Before going to bed, the king sent a valuable diamond to Lady Macbeth to show his appreciation. Lady Macbeth was very happy with the king's kindness. The king went to his bedroom early in the evening. Two soldier attendants slept in the same room as the king as usual. In the middle of the night, when it was quiet and only bad people and murderers were awake, Lady Macbeth woke up to plan the king's murder. She was afraid that her husband, Macbeth, wouldn't have the determination to do what was needed. Lady Macbeth took a dagger and went to the king's bed. But when she saw the king's face, it reminded her of her own father. She couldn't go through with the plan. She returned to Macbeth, who was also having second thoughts about the murder because of his moral concerns. He thought about reasons not to do it, like his close relationship with the king and the king's good qualities. He realized that killing King Duncan would damage his own reputation and the honor he had earned through the king's favor. However, Lady Macbeth was determined to carry out the evil plan. She used persuasive words to convince Macbeth that the murder was easy to do and would give them ultimate power and control. She insulted him for changing his mind and accused him of being fickle and cowardly. Lady Macbeth even said that if she had promised to do it, she would have killed her own baby, who was breastfeeding and smiling at her. She suggested that they could blame the murder on the drunken and sleepy attendants. With her persuasive words, she scolded him for being indecisive and encouraged him to regain the courage needed for the bloody task. Armed with a dagger, Macbeth quietly went to the room where Duncan was sleeping. As he walked, he thought he saw another dagger in the air with drops of blood on the blade and tip. But when he tried to grab it, he realized it was just a figment of his feverish and overwhelmed mind, a creation of the task he was about to do. Shaking off this fear, he entered the king's room and quickly killed him with one stab of his dagger. Right after committing the murder, one of the attendants sleeping in the room laughed in his sleep, while the other shouted, Murder! 
This momentary disturbance woke both of the soldier attendants up, but after saying a short prayer, one of them said, God bless us, and the other responded with Amen. Then they went back to sleep. Macbeth, who was listening to them, tried to say Amen when the attendant said, God bless us. But despite desperately needing a blessing, he couldn't say the word. It got stuck in his throat. He couldn't utter it. Once again, he thought he heard a voice saying, You cannot sleep anymore, Macbeth has murdered sleep the innocent sleep that gives life nourishment. The voice echoed throughout the entire house, repeating, You cannot sleep anymore. Glamis has murdered sleep, and Cotter won't sleep anymore. Macbeth won't sleep anymore. Disturbed by horrifying thoughts, Macbeth went back to his wife, who suspected that he had failed in his mission and that their plan had been ruined. He was in such a distressed state that she scolded him for lacking determination. After she found that he killed the king, she told him to wash his hands stained with blood. Meanwhile, she took his dagger and planned to smear the faces of the soldier attendants with blood to make them look guilty. Morning came, and the murder was discovered, unable to be hidden. Although Macbeth and his wife pretended to be grief-stricken and presented convincing evidence against the attendants, which included the dagger in their bloody faces, suspicions ultimately fell on Macbeth himself. Macbeth's motives for the crime were much stronger than those of the weak-minded attendants. King Duncan's two sons fled. The eldest son, Malcolm, sought refuge in the English court, while the younger son, Denalbin, escaped to Ireland. With the rightful heirs to the throne gone, Macbeth, as the next in line, was crowned king, fulfilling the literal prediction of the strange sisters. Despite their newfound power, Macbeth and his queen couldn't forget the prophecy that their own lineage wouldn't inherit the throne, but rather the descendants of Banquo. Realizing that they had stained their hands with blood and committed terrible crimes just to secure the throne for Banquo's descendants tormented them. They decided to get rid of both Banquo and his son to prevent the prophecy of the strange figures from coming true again. To achieve this, they organized a grand feast and invited all the important nobles, including Banquo and his son Flens, treating them with special courtesy. Macbeth arranged for murderers to ambush Banquo on his way to the palace that night. Banquo was stabbed to death. However, Flens managed to escape during the chaos. It was from Flint's descendants that a line of kings would eventually rise to the Scottish throne, later uniting the crowns of England and Scotland. During the banquet, the queen acted graciously and hospitably, impressing everyone with her royal manners. Macbeth talked with his local governors and nobles, pretending he wanted Banquo to join them. Just as he said this, the ghost of Banquo, whom Macbeth had ordered to be killed, entered the room and sat in the chair meant for Macbeth. Although Macbeth was usually brave and fearless, he turned pale with terror and couldn't move. His eyes fixed on the ghost. His queen and the nobles couldn't see the ghost but noticed Macbeth staring intensely at an empty chair. They thought he was going mad. She whispered to him, reminding him of the hallucination of a floating dagger he had seen before killing King Duncan. But Macbeth continued to see the ghost and didn't pay attention to his wife's words. He spoke incoherently and almost revealed things he shouldn't have. Afraid that their terrible secret would be exposed, the queen quickly dismissed the guests, explaining Macbeth's behavior as a recurring illness. Macbeth and his queen were tormented by horrible thoughts. They both had restless nights filled with terrible dreams. The fact that Banquo's son, Flens, had escaped troubled them greatly. They feared that Flens would have children who would become kings and prevent Macbeth's own descendants from inheriting the throne. These miserable thoughts haunted them relentlessly, and Macbeth decided to seek out the weird figures again to learn more about the future. He found them in a cave on the heath. They already knew he was coming because of their foresight. They were performing dark spells and summoning evil spirits to reveal the future. Their ingredients included toads, bats, snakes dog tongues, lizard legs, owl wings, dragon scales, and the finger of a dead child. They boiled all these ingredients in a large pot and cooled it with animal blood whenever it got too hot. They added the blood of a sow that had eaten her own babies and the grease that had dripped from a murderer's gallows. Through these rituals, they bound the evil spirits to answer their questions. 
the weird sisters asked Macbeth if he wanted their master's spirits to answer his doubts. Macbeth wasn't scared by the frightening rituals he witnessed. He fearlessly said, Where are they? Show them to me. The three spirits appeared one after another. The first one took the form of a head wearing armor. It called Macbeth by name and warned him to be cautious of Macduff, the governor of Fife. Macbeth thanked the spirit for the warning, as he had already suspected Macduff. Next, a second spirit appeared as a bloody child. It addressed Macbeth by name and reassured him, saying he shouldn't fear anyone because no one born from a woman could harm him. It encouraged him to be strong, ruthless, and determined. Macbeth exclaimed, Macduff! Why should I fear you? But just to be sure, you won't live either. I will eliminate any doubt or threat. After dismissing that spirit, a third one appeared as a child wearing a crown and holding a tree. It called Macbeth by name and comforted him, saying he wouldn't be defeated until Burnham Forest moved to his castle hill. Delighted by this prophecy, Macbeth said, Great signs. Wonderful. Who can uproot a forest and move it? After leaving the witch's cave, Macbeth received news that Macduff, the governor of Fife, had fled to England to join forces with Malcolm, the rightful heir to the throne. They planned to overthrow Macbeth and put Malcolm in the position of king. Macbeth was furious and attacked Macduff's castle. Macbeth brutally killed Macduff's wife, children, and anyone connected to him. These terrible actions turned Macbeth's top nobles against him. Many joined Malcolm and Macduff, who were gathering a strong army in England. Others secretly supported them but were too scared of Macbeth to openly show it. Macbeth struggled to recruit new followers because everyone despised him. Now no one loved or respected him. He had nobody to care for or trust. Macbeth began to envy the peaceful rest of Duncan, the king he had murdered. Duncan remained undisturbed in his grave, safe from harm and threats. During this time, the queen, who had willingly participated in their evil deeds, took her own life. Overwhelmed by guilt and the public's hatred, she couldn't bear the weight of her actions. Her death left Macbeth completely alone, without anyone to love, care for, or confide in. He became indifferent to life and wished for death. Hearing Malcolm's army approaching, Macbeth regained a hint of his former courage. He decided he would die wearing his armor he still held on to the deceptive promises of the witches. He remembered their prophecies that he couldn't be harmed by anyone born of a woman, and that he would be invincible until Burnham Forest moved to his castle hill. He believed these events were impossible. So, Macbeth locked himself inside his castle, thinking it was impenetrable and safe from a siege. He grimly waited for Malcolm's arrival. One day, a messenger arrived, frightened and pale. He could barely speak about what he had seen. The messenger claimed that while watching on a hill, he witnessed Burnham Forest come alive and move. Macbeth got furious and threatened to hang the messenger if he was lying. Doubt crept into his heart. He began to question the vague words of the spirits. He wasn't supposed to fear until Burnham Forest reached his castle hill. Now it seemed like the forest was actually moving. Still, he declared that if the messenger spoke the truth, they should prepare for battle. There was no escape or hiding. Macbeth expressed his weariness of life and his desire for it to end. With these desperate words, Macbeth faced the approaching army that had reached his castle. The mysterious sight that frightened the messenger had a simple explanation. As the forces marched through Burnham Forest, Malcolm instructed each soldier to cut a branch and carry it in front of them. This tactic aimed to hide the true size of their army. Seeing soldiers approaching with branches created the illusion of a moving forest. The words of the spirits came true, but in a different way than Macbeth had thought. One of his main sources of confidence crumbled. A big fight broke out. Macbeth fought hard even though his supposed allies secretly disliked him and favored Malcolm and Macduff. Macbeth killed anyone who stood against him. Finally, Macbeth faced Macduff in a duel. Macduff had been searching tirelessly for Macbeth and scolded him for killing his family. Macbeth, burdened by the guilt of Macduff's relatives, initially avoided the fight. 
but Macduff kept provoking him, insulting him and calling him names like a tyrant, murderer, hellhound, and villain. Then Macbeth remembered the spirit's words that no man born of a woman could harm him. Confidently, Macbeth told Macduff that his efforts were useless because he had a special protection that made him invulnerable to harm from ordinary births. But Macduff countered, urging Macbeth to let go of his false sense of security. He revealed that he was not born in the usual way but was untimely ripped from his mother's womb. Upon hearing this, Macbeth's remaining confidence shattered. Macbeth trembled and cursed the deceitful witches and spirits who played with words. He realized that this situation was going to fulfill their promises in literal ways while crushing his hopes. Macbeth refused to fight Macduff. Macduff sneered, We will display you like a monstrous sight and write on a sign, here people can see the tyrant. Macbeth declared, I won't live to kneel before young Malcolm or endure the curses of the common people. His courage was fueled by desperation. Even if Burnham Forest has come to my castle hill and you, who are not born of a woman, oppose me, I will fight until the end. With these words of madness, Macbeth attacked Macduff. After a fierce battle, Macduff emerged as the winner. He beheaded Macbeth and presented his head to Malcolm, the rightful king. After being unjustly deprived by Macbeth, Malcolm was in power now. He ascended to the throne amidst the cheers of the nobles and the people. 